In this short video, we're going to talk about invertible operators and matrices. Now, we know about invertible functions from basic algebra. Remember, if you have a function and there is another function, g, which will undo the function f, we call that function invertible. In other words, we have this idea of composition. That means chaining these functions together. If I have x as my input, g does something to x, but then f undoes that. So you get x back again. And f and g undo each other. So if I start off with x, f does something to x, g undoes that, you get x back again. So in order for this to happen, f has to be a special type of function. We call it must be one to one. Remember, a function means that for every input, there's a unique output. For every x, there's only one y. For it to be one to one, then you have to say for every y, there's exactly one x, where f of x equals y. That's what it means for the function to be 1 to 1. We call this function that undoes f the inverse of f. And we write it this way. We have f with a superscript negative 1. And what we say is f inverse. And what that says is that if a is the input to f and the output is b, then if you put b as the input to the inverse of f, the output must be a. And of course, these functions are inverses of each other. In other words, uh, f does, I mean, f inverse undoes f, and f undoes f inverse. So we, we could write that as that the inverse of f inverse is f itself. So that's just a quick review from elementary algebra. Now, we know that linear transformations are functions. So it should make sense that we have an invertible linear transformation. Now, there's some conditions that are necessary in order for the linear transformation t to be invertible. The first condition is that it should be one to one. And the second condition is that it needs to be on to. So because it's both injective and surjective, we call it a bijection or an isomorphism. But really, both of those things mean an invertible linear transformation. Now, if t is invertible, then we know that m has to equal n. Because if n is greater than m, we know that t cannot be 1 to 1. Right. That's just saying that the input space is larger than the output space. Right. If n is larger than m, then you can't have 1 to 1, because we have to map everything in the input space to something in the output space. So if the input space is bigger than the output space, then multiple things from the input space are going to get mapped to the same thing in the output space. So if n is greater than m, t cannot be 1 to 1. And on the other hand, if n is less than m, t cannot be on to. That's saying if the input space is, I mean, sorry, the input space is smaller than the output space, then even if you map everything from the input space, you're not going to cover everything in the output space. So if we we're going to have both, one to one and on to, then m has to equal n. And of course, that means that the input space and the output space are the same Euclidean space. And t must be an operator. 
All right, so now uh, if we have a linear operator, we're, not every linear operator is invertible, but we can say that it's invertible if and only if there's a unique linear operator, which we'll call the inverse of t, or t inverse, which undoes the action of t. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you start with v as your input, t does something to it, produces the vector w, then there's another linear operator, t inverse, which takes w as the input and has to give you v as the output. And so for this is for every vector v in Rn. And now if you write that same statement in terms of our composition notation that says if v is the input to t, t does something to it, t inverse undoes that, so you get v back again. If w is the input, input to t inverse, t inverse does something to that, then t undoes whatever t inverse does, and you get the same vector w back. And so t and t inverse undo each other. Okay. So let's talk a minute about the identity operator. The identity operator, so we'll, don't get confused about the, all of these symbols here, right? The capital letter I here is like the capital T that we've been using for a linear transformation or a linear operator. But now, the, all three of these symbols together stand for one linear operator. We call it the identity operator. And we call it the identity operator because it doesn't do anything. The, whatever input you give, it just returns that same vector as the output. So it does nothing. It, it just doesn't change the vector at all. And you know, since we can see that if you start with w, you put it into t inverse, whatever t inverse does, t undoes it, and you get w back again, then when you compose t with t inverse, it's just like applying the identity operator. And the same thing if you go the other direction. If you start with t first and then apply t inverse, that's going to be the same as just applying the identity operator. When you compose a function with this inverse or the inverse with the original function, then in the end, that just does nothing to the input vector. And of course, yeah, t and t inverse are inverses of each other. The inverse of t inverse would be t itself. Well, how does this apply to matrices? Well, we know, of course, there's this direct connection between operators and square matrices, right? So we'll say that a square matrix is invertible if the linear operator corresponding to that square matrix is invertible. So remember, we can always define a linear operator acting on a vector v as the standard matrix multiplied times v. And so if this operator then would be one to one and on to, then the matrix A is going to be invertible. And what do we know about that? Well, that would mean that many things, but certainly one thing would be if I looked at the reduced row echelon form of A, there's no free variables, there's no row of zeros. All right, so what would that also mean in terms of uh, the, the inverse, right? A has, if it's invertible, it must have an inverse. Well, that would be a matrix B, where if you multiply A times B, you get the identity matrix. And that should make sense based on what we talked about with linear operators. We said that if you had a you took an operator, composed it with its inverse, that's the same as the identity operator. And so in the world of matrices, composition turns into multiplication. So if you take A, multiply it times its inverse, you should get the identity matrix. Or if you take the inverse and multiply it times A, you get the identity matrix. So
Yeah, B is the inverse of A, and the way we write the inverse is we put it as a superscript. It's not an exponent. It looks like an exponent, um, and uh, that's going to be useful uh, later, but uh, for now, it's just a superscript, and we just say A inverse, or the inverse of A. And they're inverses of each other. So the inverse of A inverse is A itself. And there's only one inverse for any particular uh, matrix. So in other words, if you have two matrices and they undo the action of A, in other words, they satisfy that A times B equals I and A times C equals I, or B times A equals I, C times A equals I, then B has to equal C. And let's see if we can show that algebraically. Let's see if we can come to the conclusion, based on these facts, that uh, if we have two different, we think they're two matrices, that satisfy this condition, that act as the inverse of A, that those matrices actually should be exactly the same. Well, let's just start with one of our conditions, that AC is the identity matrix. Well, let's go ahead and multiply then on the left by B, all right? If we multiply on the left by B, um, we have to be a little bit careful about this, but uh, certainly um, uh, we're going to trust right now that when you multiply on the left by B that you get a, an equivalent equation. Well, what can I do then? I can multiply out on the right-hand side. B times I will just be B. And I can rearrange the parentheses just using this associative property of matrix multiplication. Now, but what is B times A? Well, we're told that B times A is uh, the identity matrix. And what is the identity matrix times any matrix? Well, you just get the same matrix back again. And that tells me that C would have to equal B. All right. How do we calculate the inverse? Well, we're going to learn a general procedure in the next video. But for now, there's a nice formula for 2 by 2 matrices. And this is the way it's usually written. We write the four entries of A as A, B, C, D. And then the inverse is given by this formula. And if you look at this formula carefully, you're going to see that we have AD on the diagonal of A, DA on the diagonal of A inverse. So these two guys are going to swap places. Instead of having A and D, I have D and A. And look at the off diagonal. Here I have B and C. They don't change places, they change sign. And finally, we've got this multiplier in front. We're going to have to take the reciprocal of AD minus BC. And we're going to learn that that's going to be called the determinant later. And the sometimes a good memory aid is you can draw this picture of a fish in order to perform the multiplication. You take AD, then subtract off BC. Now, certainly we can't divide by 0. So already, if we have a 2 by 2 matrix, we know that if AD minus BC is 0, then A inverse cannot exist. The matrix cannot be invertible. So let's go ahead and apply this uh, formula to three examples of 2 by 2 matrices and calculate their inverses if it exists. So with the matrix A, just substituting in the values for A, B, C, and D, what do I do? Swap the diagonal entries. So now I have the negative 2 and then the 2 down here. 
change the sign of the off diagonal. So now I have a negative 3 and a positive 2. And then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of 2 times negative 2 gives me negative 4 minus 3 times negative 2. So I'll be subtracting a negative 6. And negative 4 plus 6 gives me 2. So I could multiply in the 1 half, but it's probably easier to leave it out in front. And let's go ahead and uh, perform a little check here just to be sure that I didn't make a mistake. And the check that I'm going to perform is I'm going to see if I take A inverse and I multiply it times A, it should equal the identity matrix. So if I have 1 half, so negative 2, negative 3, 2, 2, multiply that times A, which is 2, 3, negative 2, negative 2. Let's just see what I get. So the 1 half, that multiplier, I'm just going to keep that as a multiplier. Let's perform the matrix, matrix multiplication. I'll have a negative 4 plus 6. That gives me 2. I'll have a negative 6 plus 6 gives me 0. 4 minus 4 gives me another 0. And then 6 minus 4 is 2. And now if I go ahead and multiply in the 1 half, I get the identity matrix. 1, 0, 0, 1. So good. Made the correct computation there. What about the matrix B? Again, I apply the formula. Um, swapping the diagonal entries doesn't really matter because they are uh, both the 0. Changing the sign, now I've got to have negative ones there. And then I've got to multiply out in front the reciprocal of 0 minus 1. Well, that would be multiplying by negative 1. And so look what happens here. B inverse is the same as B. So that's kind of a, an exceptional case. We call that type of matrix, which is its own inverse and involutory matrix. Let's just uh, double check here. If I take this matrix and multiply it times itself, I should get the identity matrix. And sure enough, I get 1, then I'll get 0, then another 0, and 1. Now, this is uh, should make sense if we remember what this matrix represents. Um, there's two ways to think about it. This is the elementary row operation of taking row 1 and interchanging it with row 2. Well, if you think about that, is that reversible? Sure. What would you do? If I swapped row 1 and row 2, I wanted to get it back. Well, swap row and row 2 again, row 1 and row 2, and you'll get back to the original matrix. And so it would make sense, based on that interpretation of this matrix, that as an, representing an elementary row operation, as an elementary matrix, that it should be its own inverse. And we also saw that this represents a reflection in the line y equals x. And so if I have the line y equals x here, and I take a vector, and I reflect it in the line, well, I'm going, it's reflection right over here. Well, how do I get back to the original uh, vector, the blue vector? Well, I reflect the red vector back in the line y equals x. So it makes sense that any reflection should be involutory, right? or an involution, that it should undo itself. You start with a vector, reflect it in a line. Well, how do you get back to the original vector? Reflect the image in the same line, and you get back to the same vector.
So that makes sense. And it has a nice interpretation in two ways, geometrically, but also as an elementary matrix. All right. So, uh, oh yeah, and then of course that means that B squared equals the identity matrix. Now, if you look at our matrix C, uh, it is not invertible. It does not have an inverse. Uh, C inverse does not exist. And we can see that for two reasons. Um, at least two reasons, right? The columns are parallel to each other. The second column is two times the first column. So they're parallel to each other, which means that they do not form a linearly independent set which means that if I were to look at the reduced row echelon form, I would have a free variable, which in turn means that the linear transformation corresponding to this matrix cannot be one to one. So it can't be invertible. And the other thing is, which is probably just simpler, if we calculate in our formula, I would get 4 minus 4, which is, of course, 0. And 1 over 0 is not defined. All right, so finally, what can we say about the matrix of the inverse of a linear operator? Well, first of all, we can say that uh, there's got to be uh, an equivalent statement that and the linear operator is invertible if and only if its standard matrix is an invertible matrix. Uh, that, sh that should make a lot of sense there. And it should also make sense that the standard matrix of the inverse of the linear operator is the inverse of the standard matrix for T. So I hope that uh, you have a deeper understanding now about uh, the inverse of a linear operator and the inverse of matrices, um, we can always represent then the inverse of a linear operator if we can find the standard matrix for the inverse, which means we need to be able to compute the inverse of a square invertible matrix. And we'll learn how to do that in our next video.